presentation features Dr. Harry S. Brody, Professor Emeritus of Philosophy of Education, University of Illinois. Professor Brody is the author of numerous books and scholarly articles and is recognized for establishing the philosophical justification for the arts in general education. He is speaking to a group of public school teachers and administrators. My assignment today is the role of the arts and arts education in general education. There's a current sentiment for legislation to make art or art education part of the required curriculum of general education in American public schools. Well, why, why are they mandating it? At least, why are some states mandating it? Why should the public schools spend its money on putting the arts in the schools? Because somehow we're dedicated to a public school system in which the total population is supposed to acquire a general education. Now, that's a big promise. No nation has ever promised that before. And part of redeeming that promise is to take the arts seriously, a part of the required curriculum. But what then do we need to show? We've got to show that art is a necessary part of the general education curriculum. Professor Brody discusses art as a means to understand the aesthetic dimension of everyday life. He comments on the uniqueness of aesthetic experience and its relationship to other values. Ways that the aesthetic dimension enriches experience are mentioned, as aesthetic images influence our judgments and provide the basis for verbal language. Professor Brody views art education as a means to expand and refine the imagination. First of all, we have to show the school board, the well-intentioned citizenry, yes, the people who pay the bill. We have to show them first that art is, an, is a part of the aesthetic experience and the, the aesthetic experience is absolutely unique. It's so unique, it's so special that it can't be incorporated in any other subject in the curriculum. If it can be, why don't you do it and don't bother with another curriculum? So the case has to be made. This is a unique form of experience. Well, what's unique about it? Well, briefly, I'm going to ask you. What do you do when you have a pain, a severe pain, in the neck or somewhere else? You can report it in words, I have a pain in the neck. And someone said, well, where is it? So you point to it, the pain is in, in the neck. And then you call the doctor. What does a pain in the neck look like? Well, he uses instruments, x-rays, and he gets a very peculiar image of what a pain looks like. It certainly doesn't look the way it feels. If you've seen an x-ray of a pain in the neck, then you know it doesn't the way, that isn't the way it feels. Well, what does it feel like? Well, why don't we take the pain out of the neck and put it out here and draw a portrait of it? That's the way it feels. That's exactly what art does. Art creates a portrait of human feeling such that we can observe it and react to it. This is something no other species can do. Portraits of feeling. This is the uniqueness of the aesthetic experience. This is the uniqueness of art that helps produce these portraits. And whether the portrait is perceived as a mountain or a sunset 
or a painting about a, a sunset or a mountain doesn't make any difference. They're both aesthetic experiences. They're not practical experiences. They're not scientific experiences. They're highly individual, unique portraits of feeling. Nowhere in the curriculum is there a combination of feelingful knowledge and knowledgeful feeling except in the art. All right, suppose we grant that it is unique. If it's that unique, maybe we shouldn't bother with it. How is it related to everything else? After all, we have a whole, a whole curriculum. We have a life that's full of other kinds of experiences. Is this a peculiar oddity that we can mention and then forget? How is it related to all the others? How many of you have ridden by uh, looking for a restaurant? And you've looked at the sign and said, now that's going to be an expensive place to eat. You are making a value judgment on what basis? On a portrait, a visible portrait, that you perceive as being expressive of what? Well of the value of money, or what money can buy to satisfy other values. I don't have to tell you that all of advertising is based on the aesthetic experience of images that portray value and portray a desire to possess the object that's being, that's being advertised. I'll run through the others, health, health values. We value health. Health values are expressed by images of what? The healthy body. Which is in itself an ideal of some kind. Of sound mind and sound body. That's a metaphor. The affectional values. The familial values the civic values, patriotism and loyalty and citizenship, all of these mean very little to people unless they can form an image of it. Politicians are very busy all year round, but especially every four years, creating what? An image of their loyalty, their bravery, their ability, their citizenship, and above all, their devotion to this country. And the image is what will get the votes, not the facts. We're going through a period of that kind when the image is being tested against the facts. The image will win out. Because most of us can never know the facts. We decide by the image. Well, look at the other values, the religious values. Where would the religious values be without images of feeling corresponding to the tenets of that religion? Whether the images are in, in music or the dance or in literature or in painting. The attempt, the everlasting attempt to capture in an image the portrait of feeling religious. So without imagery, much of science, much of our thinking is impossible. We can learn the formula. Why did Newton discover certain physical laws by being hit on the head with an apple? I don't know how many yokels have been hit with apples in the course of history. <laughs> but Newton had something the others didn't. As we'll see, he could form images that laid the groundwork for theory. And so we come to the aesthetic values. They permeate every other area. And I shall try to give you some more examples as I go along. Without, without a cultivated ability to construe portraits of feeling 
our experience becomes highly diminished. And as, as we shall see, the extension of the range of feeling, the refinements of the small differences of feeling, is what general education is committed to produce by the means of arts education. Anger has a thousand dimensions. How many of those dimensions do we perceive? How many of those variations are part of our own feeling experience? The language we use to describe them indicates the relative poverty that most of us have about most of the emotions. It's to art that we turn for the exfoliation, the refinement, the extension of feeling about uh, a portraits of feeling. And some of those portraits actually engender feelings that we've never had before. Now I hope I've given some indication as to why we can make the case that not only is the aesthetic experience unique, irreplaceable, but it's related to every other, every other value domain in our experience. This is not a luxury for well-to-do people in times of leisure. Dr. Brody explains how most of the judgments that we make in our daily lives are based on aesthetic images rather than on scientific facts. He argues that our perception of the aesthetic content of imagery is crucial and that this perception can be educated and refined. I'd like to give you a few illustrations from very ordinary experience, all very almost trivial ones, to make this point of the ubiquity of the aesthetic component of experience. I live in a university town too, and in my walks to and from the office, I pass a great many houses, some very big ones, incidentally. And one of them, oh, has a lawn that's just littered with rocks and weeds, pieces of timber. What judgment do we make about the inhabitants of the house? Well, they're either civic slobs or they're a bunch of students who have sort of formed a commune or are living there for the year and they don't bother and they don't care. And you come back a year later and you find the same rocks, the same pieces of lumber, the same weeds on the lawn. But now they're arranged in circles, in triangles, in patterns all over the lawn. Now who's living in the house? A she couple? People who'd like to get their homes in the house and gardens? You know it isn't a little old lady because she wouldn't do this with a lawn. This is a queer person, but there's no question, there's no question that our judgment is changed completely. By what? The sheer appearance of it. Suppose you were in a hotel, ten stories up, and you heard a commotion, and you looked out the window, and you saw uh, an old gentleman, maybe not even a gentleman, sort of staggering around and bellowing, what would you do? Well, you'd call down to the operator and say, there's a drunk out there, do something. Police would arrive, take him in custody, and peace would be restored. But suppose before the police came, another old gentleman came from the wings, and began dancing in perfect unison with the first old geezer and bellowing in harmony with him. Now whom would you call? Now what's the difference? One old drunk 
is a, is a social nuisance. Two old drunks being drunk in unison is an aesthetic experience. <laughs> and you, you, you can buy a ticket to see it performed on the stage. <laughs> well, I hope this will give you an idea of why I think it is important to convince ourselves that the aesthetic experience, which is, which is what art portrays, is neither, you, is neither <clears throat> so special that only a few people can experience it, that it is not alien to common experiences, that it is at the basis of 98% of our judgments about anything. Most of the people we meet, we judge not by fact, but by appearance. And I would say more than 80% of adolescents' maladjustment is, a, is due to aesthetic difficulties and not to intellectual ones. It's a matter of imagery. What they, are, what they think they are being perceived as, what they like to be perceived as, what the crowd is being, wants them to be perceived as. It's the image that counts. The role of aesthetic imagery in the understanding of language is Dr. Brody's next topic. He claims that a poverty of imagery results in a poverty of understanding, and that a lack of understanding of the arts results in an inability to participate in educated discourse. Language. Suppose you had a friend who was not an English speaker, but who had an English dictionary, that is, a, a dictionary of English and his own language, her own language. And you said, we worked around the clock. Now, the lexical meaning is no mystery. You can look up each word, find out what the lexical means. Would he understand the locution? Probably not. Especially if you're wearing a digital watch. <laughs> which has no face and no arms. Oh, yet we take it for granted that in our, everybody will understand that locution. Well, to extend that, most of the words in English are derived from earlier words which were images of something important. We've retained the word and its derivation, but we may have lost the image, especially if the word was of Greek or Latin or Hebrew origin. Oh, for example, penitentiary. You all know what a penitentiary is like, not from personal experience, but you've heard of these. It's a prison. Well, but the word is derived from a word that doesn't mean prison at all. It means a place for penitence, which is quite different from a, a high security prison. The terms describing automobiles vary with, with the, the language. The British talk of windscreens, we talk of windshields. Is that the same? Not quite. A windscreen and a windshield are different portraits of feeling. Uh, as usual, the American locution is a little more rugged. Shield is a stronger image than a screen, which allows something to come through if it isn't too vile. Now you say, what difference does it make? A windshield is a windshield is a windshield. I know what it is. I know the referential meaning of the word. But don't bother me with these derivations. Fine. Only stop teaching English poetry. Certainly through the time of Eliot. Because the poet depends on the reader to bring to the written word the images that were derived from very old expressions. If you don't bring that to the word, you don't get the poem. 
You take all the literary quality and quality, squeeze it out. All that's left is a dry textual meaning. And to expand and refine the imagination is probably the first goal that we promise in aesthetic education. And I'd like to dwell on the importance of that too, because it isn't obvious. Imagination is a word that trips slightly on the tongue. Everybody has an imagination. And it's not always a, 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 a plus word. You're imagining things is not really a compliment. But on the power of the imagination depends all of our creativity, whether it's in science or in the arts, in any field whatsoever. And what is the secret of this power of the imagination? It's a wonderful secret. As far as I know, it's never been vouchsafed to any species but ours. It's the ability to free the mind from fact, from reality. We have a power to free ourselves from reality. Not from what is, but from what might be. Again, I'm using coarse examples because we haven't time to go into a long refinement of it. But think of what imagination has done to various types of human activity. We call them human. Feeding. We share this with the animals, don't we? The intake of food, nutrition. Look what we've done with just the simple act of feeding. Getting hold of something and ingesting it. We've made dining. We've created the whole field of dining out of a simple act of appropriating nutrition. Which is just as nutrition if it comes out from under a rock as it is if it's prepared in the best chef in the, in the world. How have we done it? Not by adhering to reality. No, but contriving things that really have no relation to reality, or certainly no obvious one. All right, feeding becomes dining. Shelter. Most animals take shelter wherever they can, under a rock, in a cave, under a tree. And if that's successful, they survive. If they isn't successful, they disappear, and that's it. Look what our imagination has done with shelter. All of architecture, all of construction, is based on the imagination of what might be. The severing of the symbol from the thing. Once we sever the word from the thing, the, the symbol from its referent, we have an extraordinary freedom, which we call human freedom. It's the essence of all human freedom. All our ideals depend on our ability to imagine what we couldn't always verify in reality. I can't, I can't overestimate this for our, <coughs> for our attempt to justify the arts as part of general education because they have so much to do with the cultivation of the imagination, of the source of all our real freedom. Hinges on that, on that. And you know it as teachers, where a youngster has no imagination, or can't separate the symbol from the thing, he's bound by the immediate reality, there's very little hope for creativity or anything else. Now, I don't know of any more powerful argument for the necessity of the arts and of general education, but particularly what we can do with it in, uh, as a result of imagination. All our theories of ethics, all our theories of citizenships, all our theories about the good society come out of someone imagining what might be and then convert it into something 
that's possible and makes, then makes it the object of effort and so forth and so on, trying to realize it. Without that, we are really no more than the animal. I'd like to close this, this discussion, if I may, with just a few other remarks about the role of, role of art in the development in education. One is, I think, a, not a trivial example, but I think a telling one. You're all familiar with the assassination of President Kennedy. And every year, despite all the commissions, there's a theory that says it couldn't have happened that way. Why aren't we satisfied with the explanation? It's because aesthetically it's no good. Great men cannot be assassinated by haphazard means by lunatics, by crazies. The event has to match the importance of the occasion. The real story of that assassination will be told by a playwright who will write a play that will tell exactly what happened. It will be aesthetically right. It may be factually all wrong, but it will be, that will be the thing we'll remember. The new woman, the new society, those will not take hold until they quit, literally capture our imagination. And the only ones who can do that are the artists. Finally, do you want to be educated? Do we have to be? We don't need to be. Never have so many lived so well in the brains of so few. You and I don't have to understand refrigerators, cars, or anything. We just use them. The choice of being educated is a moral choice. It either grabs you and then you can't let go of it, or there's no use arguing with you. I'm trying to argue for this. Stop praising the arts. Stop s telling us how wonderful they are. As far as the public schools are concerned, whether they're wonderful or not, if they're not necessary, there's no room for them. Are they necessary is the point. Not are they desirable or are they interesting or anything else. And that, it seems to me, is a serious task that people in arts education have to face. With those remarks, I commend you for your efforts on behalf of the arts. Thank you.